Let's start in. We're in uh, 1 John. This is a, a series that we are doing on 1 John. It's going to take us through into, into August. And then we're going to kind of hold it out loosely a little bit as far as if we get into 2 and 3 John to kind of conclude that. If it goes the way it's going, because I had uh, lined up to go to verse 12 today, and I ended up, when I, as I was you know, preparing for this, I go, man, I can only go to verse 6 today. <laughs> so it's, it's, it may take us a little longer than that. But So today we are in 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 3 to 6. And so if you do have your, your scripture journal that we uh, offer for you, you can take that out. That has the scripture and some place to write some notes. Otherwise, just turn in your, your Bible uh, or your device to 1 John 2, verse 3 to 6. Here we go. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your word. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you, Holy Spirit, would convict us, that you would shape us, illuminate our minds and our hearts so that we might see clearly uh, the message that you would have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you've noticed, as I have in this, uh, the cultural trends of the day, I'm, I'm not one that is always on like the cutting edge of, of cultural trends, but I've noticed it recently with some of the, some of the clothing, some of the apparel that some young people wear. That's something that old people say, isn't it? <laughs> young people. Young people these days are, are wearing this. Um, well, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to know what to call them, right? Kids, you can't call them kids, teenagers. Anyways, uh, youth and young adults uh, are wearing some things these days. And, and I've been noticing it lately. And they're these retro rock, classic rock shirts. You've seen this? Kind of like the, you know, they got their Nirvana and, uh, or Def Leppard or something like this. And, and so they, they're wearing these, these shirts. And this is always an open door for me. To, uh, to step in and to ask some questions and to strike up a conversation. So I, I'd say, you know, oh, I, I see that you like Nirvana. What's, what's your favorite song? What's your favorite album? And they kind of look a little blank, a little, little stunned. And they just say, well, I just, I just like the T-shirt. I just like the, the shirt. Uh, I, I got to say, what gets me a little more is, is Def Leppard ones, because that was like my band, you know, back in the 80s. Anyone, anyone else with me here? Okay, yeah, a few. <laughs> so we're at the same category, yeah. But, you know, it was just like, man, Pyromania, that was, that was our volleyball, you know, pump-up album, right? Um, Hysteria came out 1987. It was a grad year right at the end of it, you know, into that next year in college. Um, and it was just like, oh. And so when someone is wearing the, these Def Leppard, is this offending you? Sorry. I, you know, it's just, it's rock music. But, you know, I'm not saying it's the best music to listen to. But, you know, it's part of my past. Can't deny it. But I see them wearing this shirt and I say, okay, what's your favorite song? Like, Love Bites, um, Rocket, you know, Armageddon. I don't know, and they're just like blank. They're just like, no idea. I just like the t-shirt, right? Same thing happens. The other, this last weekend, we were at a youth retreat, and actually a young adult was wearing a Harley shirt. And I mean, there, boom, open door, right? I'm not, I'm not a Harley guy, Kawasaki guy. I know, I know this is a Dale and me thing, but this is a thing. But I'm like, oh, you're, you're a rider. What, what, what kind of Harley do you have? Um, you know, do your, your mom or dad ride or what? Just blank. Uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? Your shirt. You're wearing a Harley shirt. Do you have like a Sportster? You know, is, is it, you know, got an Ultra Glide, Street Glide? What do, you, what do you got? I just like the shirt. 
Okay, well, um, or what about sports teams, right? We all know Oilers are out, sadly, right? Don't see as many Oiler jerseys running around anymore. Flames, never made it, sorry, sell ya. But if you see someone now wearing a, a Florida Panthers jersey, right? It's got, you know, cool looking Panther on the front there and they're doing well. And you ask them, well, who's your favorite player? You know, can you name three or four players? And they're just like, no, I just, I just like to look at the shirt. This is, this is the thing. This is trouble in our, in our culture, right? Or you see someone perhaps that's wearing a cross. And you ask them, oh, I, I like your, your cross. What does the cross mean to you? And they say, I, I just, it's just jewelry. I just like the way it looks. Now, hear me. <laughs> I'm not the fashion police. You can, you know, wear what you like. Um, I, I will probably ask you a question if you're wearing a Def Leppard shirt. But, but you know, I think that this somewhat speaks to the, the culture and the confusion that abounds in our culture when there's our internal lives don't match the external. And this also speaks to how our world looks at Christians. See, our culture looks at the exterior and struggles to know the truth about Jesus because, quite honestly, Christians often don't look like Jesus. What does a Christian look like? Now, we can be quick to pass off any evaluative marks common thing we would say or we'd say well you know we can't see their heart can't see their heart and this is true and we know that God alone can and he alone is the judge of our hearts but I ask you is that is that something that we see in scripture that it's just about what's in the heart I mean that's important and that's where things stem from and the motives come from our heart. But is there other ways that we can be sure that we are in the light? This is what I believe the book of 1 John is about. How can you know that you are in the light? So we've talked about this the last couple of weeks. Uh, I brought it up the first week and then John Mormon. Uh, this is where it gets confusing is because we're in 1 John, and the author is John, and John spoke last week, so I'll try to clarify where it's John Mormon and where it's the author of 1 John. John. All right, but we talked about the first week introducing this idea of, of three tests, three evaluative kind of measuring points, or what Robert Law says are the tests of life that signal the authenticity of spiritual vigor. Okay, there's, there's tests that, that say, is this authentic? Is this something that's true in your life? Are you in the light? And so there's the truth test or theological test. And this has to do with specifically what you believe about Jesus, about the nature of Jesus, and also about the work of Jesus. Then there's the moral test, how you walk in obedience to the commands of God. And then there's the love test. How you love God and how that is evidenced, authenticated, really, by how you love other people. Now, these three tests are, are very closely connected. They're interconnected. It's not like when you were in school and you took, you know, algebra and English or social studies or whatever, and it's like, okay, check, I, I, you know, I aced that one, and I did okay in that one, and I failed that one as separate entities. These are all very interconnected. And it's kind of, as we said, a, a triangle of sorts where perhaps the, the bottom line of the triangle would be the, the truth test. The theological test. What do, you, what do you believe about Jesus? And everything else are the entailments or the things that, that flow out of that faith in Jesus and who he is and what he did. So we follow him. Out of our faith in him, we follow him in obedience. 
and we love. And love is also a command that we are to obey. So the author, John, he often uses this, the contrasting positions to illustrate his point. It's kind of a, a negative example and a positive example. And again, all this, if you read through 1 John, it's not in a, in a linear fashion. It's kind of weaving and bobbing at times. It's like he's having this conversation. It's like, oh, yeah, about this. But then that's connected to this. And then and we go there. And then, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, about that. And so it kind of goes back and forth and back and forth, weaving its way through. And so as you read it, sometimes you might say, hey, that sounds familiar. It's like he's talked about that before. And that's exactly John's point. And that's the way he does it. When you are learning things repetitively, it comes back and comes back around. And this is how you learn. So it's like, oh, that sounds familiar. So here we go. Uh, Starting in verse 3 is where he introduces this idea. It kind of looks at the negative side of it first. So it says, whoever says, I know him, I know Jesus, but does not keep his commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. All right. So bit by bit here as we go through this, it says, first of all, says, someone says that I know him. Okay, they're raising their hand saying, yep, I know, I know Jesus. They're, they're wearing the t-shirt. A number of years ago, I, I had the opportunity to meet one of my, my childhood, I mean, he's, he's the same age as me, but, you know, Joe Sackick. Uh, and so he was, just won the Stanley Cup. 2004, I think, and I met him after that in, in a theme park in Calgary, and I, I went up to him, and he was walking with his wife and kids, and I, I just said, I don't even know what I said, I was, whatever, I, congratulations on, on winning the Stanley Cup or something like that, and, and we, we chatted a little bit, walked along, and, and he was very friendly and, and nice, asked me about things, because he, he played hockey in my hometown, a Swift Current, and so I'd seen him play a lot, never had a chance to meet him before that. But we were, we were just chatting along. And after I left him, I thought, whoa, this is like the best day ever. I'm like friends with Joe Sackick. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. And, you know, I'm talking to some people and, you know, whatever, Tanya. And I said, yeah, I'm friends with Joe She says, you know, you're not friends with him. You met him. <laughs> yeah, you've got his rookie card. <laughs> got a jersey. Are you tight now with Joe Sackick? Like you met him. This is sometimes the way it works in, in our faith. It's like we're sometimes, well, honestly, we're just a fan of God, but not really a friend of God. So this is someone that John says, okay, this person says, I know him, but, but he says that he doesn't keep his commands, keep or obey. Now this word for keep here it has to do with not just observing, it's not just a checklist, but it's actually a word that has to do with guarding or, you know, just protecting the commands of God. And so it has to do with a zealous desire to adhere to God's will. A zealous desire to adhere to God's word. This is someone that wants to do the will of God. But this person says, no, you know, I know him but disregards what God really wants. And so John says, this person is a liar. Now, this is pretty strong language, and he's already used that expression earlier in the passage that John Mormon shared last week. This person is a liar. John's not pulling any punches here. He's saying your life is a contradiction. Your life is a lie. If you say you know him, but you dis- disregard the way that he says that you should live, it's a lie. As we've said in, in previous sermon series, what does a follower do? Follows. A follower follows. And so for someone to say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a friend of God, I know God, I'm, I'm in the light, but doesn't actually follow That's a contradiction. And John says, the truth is not in him. Now, Apostle Paul also addresses this to Titus in the book of Titus, where he is charging Titus with appointing elders over the area, and one of those areas was Crete. 
And if you, if you read this passage earlier, it, it talks about Cretans, right, being kind of these this liars and, and thieves and not, not a real, uh, doesn't cast a lot of great light on, on Cretans. But some of these people, part of a group, they were professing faith, but they weren't living it. And so this is what Paul says. He says, they, these people, they claim to know God, but their actions, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything good. Again, that's pretty strong language. So they claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Now, that could be perhaps an extreme example because in some ways, failing to, to follow God and walking out the will of God and his commands, for us sometimes it doesn't come out in blatant disobedience. It comes out in apathy. I know what God wants me to do. I just, just don't really want to do it. When I was a youth pastor in Surrey, I had one of the, one of the parents in our ministry talk about her, her kids and her kids' friends and I remember very clearly, she said, I would rather have my, my kid apathetic than rebellious. I would rather have my kid apathetic than rebellious. And it stuck to me, like I just couldn't. Now, you might say, yeah, you know, as a parent, and I've dealt with a rebellious kid. <laughs> and it's hard, no doubt. But is apathy the win here? So on one hand, there could be outright contradiction and, and disagreeing and disobeying God. And the other hand, just this cold heart of apathy. And just still saying, yeah, you know what, I, I know God. But I really don't care what he says I should do or how I should live. If your goal as a parent is to raise nice kids whose hearts are far from Jesus in how they live, I think there needs to be a realignment. And this isn't just for parents. It's for each of us. We say, we're going to try to be a good person. We're going to come to church on Sunday, even on May long. But if the bulk of my everyday living is pretty much just selfish, doing what I want, do we fall into that category? Yeah, I, I know you, God. But you're not living in alignment with his commands. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's what follows out of love for God, is obedience. John 14, 23 says again, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. This is where we, we see the abiding. And this is what Carson was talking about in his prayer, in prayer time. As far as when we walk out of alignment, then there's, we lack the intimacy with God. Because he wants to make his home in us. Abiding with us. It comes out of obedience. Now, flips it now to the positive. But... John says, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So again, we have this word obey, keeping his word. And so again, this is someone that desires to please God. Let me ask you this. Do you desire to please God? See, if you don't, if that isn't really a motive of your heart is to please God, then, then obedience really doesn't matter. Because obedience then just becomes religious duty. And it's completely void of intimacy with God. Do you hear that? When you look at your, your life and you ask yourself, do I, do I really want to please God? Is that, is that my motive? Is that my driving factor? Is God, I want to please you. I want my life to bring you glory. I want to serve you. Because that's why I've been put here on this planet. 
that my desire to please you? John says, then when they keep the word, protect it, guard it, live it, then the love of God is perfected in him. We're going to look at this as well in a little bit later on in John, 1 John 4, verse 17. It talks about abiding with God and he with us. And when that happens, then the love of God is perfected. This is kind of a, kind of a cool word here with this perfected. Because so, we think of things sometimes as being of God, it must be perfect, must be already perfect. And it's, and it's a little bit tricky in the wording. But when we think of the love of God, we say, well, God is, God is perfect, so his love must be perfect. But what John is saying is, is a different kind of perfecting. It has to do with being made perfect, being completed in the sense that that is the purpose of it. Okay, so that's what he's saying is like God's love doesn't just exist on its own aside from in Trinity. Okay, love exemplified there in Trinity before there was anyone else to love. But now we have an opportunity to abide with God in love. And he says then it's, that's when God's love is made perfect. It's made complete because that's the goal of it. So another example would be the word of God. We say the word of God inspired, breathed by God. We say, well, it's, it is perfect from God. It comes from God. But the word of God is made perfect when we receive it, when it's planted in us. Because it's accomplishing its purpose. That's what it means. How about Jesus? Is Jesus perfect? You're like, whoa, your ears are tuning now. This is heresy going on here. This is what Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.19. It says that Jesus was made, he was perf- perfected. He was made perfect. Not because he was, he was sinless, he was holy, he was righteous, never sinned. But, it says that his, his love, his mission was perfected when he laid down his life as a sacrifice for us. What he set out to do was accomplished, and that's what it is. And so this is what John is saying about love and about being obedient to his commands. That's, it's made perfect. His love is made perfect when we actually receive it and live it. All right, so we abide in him, and then it says we walk like Jesus walked. That's, that's the person that is obedient. Now, here, here's where we're going to get a little interactive, okay? So what does it mean to walk like Jesus walked? <laughs> we think about this, okay, uh, does this mean... That we have to be a Jewish man in the uh, first century walking around in a tunic and sandals. Yeah? No. That's not what it means. Does it mean that walking as Jesus walked that we have to be sinless? Well, no. We've already heard this from John Mormon last week. Saying that this is, this is our reality and, and we can't deny the fact that we are going to sin. What about Jesus walking around literally and and healing people? Now that might be something that we have more opportunity to do as we experience, we have faith and we pray for people and we might see people healed. But overall, is that what John, the author here, is talking about? That we walk like Jesus walked. What does it mean to do that? So what we're going to do is give you an opportunity to toss that around a little bit. What do you think? What do you think it means to walk as Jesus walked. So two things. You can talk about it with the people around you a little bit, or you can text me at that number. My phone's down here. And then we'll uh, we'll have a little chat about that. And if you're watching online or at a later time, um, just talk about it with the people around you, or uh, consider it for yourself. Write some things down. What does it mean for us to walk as Jesus walked. All right? Go. Give you a few minutes. All right. To walk as Jesus walked. Obedience to the Father, which means taking time for listening, praying, Scripture, recognizing and responding to people in need, being love in action, showing compassion, serving others, speaking truth and confronting injustice, uh, living out Micah 6, verse 8, um, 
can write that one down and read that. To live a life emulated after the teachings of Jesus, not necessarily the exact lifestyle or actions. To serve one another as he did and obey the commandments. By honoring his word and living the word. Um, the picture I get is a young kid following his father on a walk and trying to step in the same steps as his dad and trying to imitate his father and his example. All right, to love people for who they are regardless of what they do or have done. Some of you have gifts of words. Maybe I'll, I'll do some, uh, maybe some posting of this afterwards. But I think walking as Jesus walked ultimately means walking in intimate relationship with the Father. Um, his life was what it was because he spent time with God, embraced the calling on his life, and through that he could live his life as God called. The more we do this, we will walk more as Jesus walked in truth and light, but with the unique purpose that God has given us. Good stuff. Uh, walking in childlike faith and being obedient to the Great Commission. All right, one more. To walk alongside people no matter the situation, to not be judgmental, but willing to point them to him and praying for them. All right, good stuff coming along. And I hope you had some good conversations there too. Uh, sometimes it's, it's hard for us to, to kind of put it all into a, um, a way that we can respond, but I think that that's the beauty of, of God's word, that as we meditate on it, as we, it, it just reveals the life of Jesus and how we are to live. Just a, a few things, and we've talked about in the past what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, and we talk about it in terms of of following the pattern that he left for us in terms of his character and his priorities. So we look at his character and we look at his priorities. What were the things that were important to him and those things should be important to us. Um, and so the character of Jesus, uh, some of you also mentioned in terms of humility and being a servant, how he loved people. These are things that should be evident in our lives as we walk with him. Just want to say a couple things as we close. Um, in terms of, of the term uh, Christian, we, we, sometimes we have a, this love-hate relationship with, with the word Christian. It means different things uh, sometimes in our world today. Uh, in Latin, the last three letters, the I-A-N, uh, means from the party of. Okay, So from the party of Christ. And Christian, the term is only used three times in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament. And all three of those times... It is used kind of in a way that's negative or, or kind of some scorn or derision attached to it. And so in Acts 11.36, when the people at Antioch were called Christians, it wasn't that they called themselves Christians. And you can do some reading on this. There's some, uh, some thoughts on that by other people that have written on it. Um, but the idea is that they called themselves followers of the way, or they called themselves disciples, but it was their conduct the way that people saw them that caused them to say, oh, you guys are just, you're so, you're so nice, you're so good, you're so kind. You're just kind of, there was a mocking thing. You're goody two-shoes, and, and you're looking, you know, you're trying to look like Jesus. And ultimately, it became a way for them to say, yeah, that's, that's, that's really what we desire to be, is from the party of Jesus. And Christianity, Christian is not necessarily a popular term today. It wouldn't be the choice for a lot of t-shirts at winners. But, you know, if you take on that name, would people around you think in any way as they walk with you, spend time with you, they'd say, hmm, you know what, you must be a follower of Jesus. Or perhaps, in our culture today, being so removed from really an understanding of who Jesus really is, might they say, you know what, you're, you're different. There's something about you that's, that's off. And in a good way, because you love people. And you're one of the first people to get up and serve others. And you know what, you're, you're kind. And you know, you tell the truth. So all these things that they might see in your life, they'd say, well, what, what is it? What is it about you that's different? So today, as we wrap this up, when others around you and me, would they get the sense when they spend time with you 
in even a small way that they are being with Jesus? Does my everyday walk resemble the walk of Jesus? Before we pray, I want to I pray for us all, because we all struggle with this, and we all, you could come out of this thinking, man, I, I'm, I'm so far off. And that is not my desire uh, for you to come away from this feeling an overwhelming sense of guilt or shame. Um, we, we serve a God who's gracious and compassionate, loves us, keeps giving us chance after chance. But he also enables us and gives us power. And so I want to leave you with a verse from Philippians 2, verse 13. It's one of my, my favorite verses. And it says this. It's in the NLT. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Okay, so there's times in our life when we don't necessarily have the desire, right? It's our will. Our will just wants to do what we want to do. And so this would be our prayer to say, God, would you change my desire? Would you give me a fresh desire, transform my will so that it's in alignment with what you want? Then there's other times that I just say, I don't have the power. I don't have the strength to do what God wants me to do. And that's what it says here, too, is that that's what God does. He gives us the change of will, new desires, but he also gives us the power to do it. And he gives us that through the Holy Spirit. So the Apostle Paul says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us who believe. He empowers us. So I invite you to, to stand, and our, our team's going to come up and lead us in a song. But I want to pray for each of us. As we seek to live out the life of Jesus in our context, recognizing we need the desire and the power, and that is something from God. God, again, we thank you for your word that, that sharpens us. Uh, Lord, it's pretty strong words. It's, it's, uh, it's convicting to each of us as we look in the mirror of your word you know, and evaluate ourselves, and we could say, am I, am I in the light? Am I saying I know you and not doing what you say, not walking in obedience to you? And so today, for each of us who might have a little inkling of a desire just to come to you in simplicity of faith and saying, Lord, I, I, I haven't been walking with you, doing what you say. And so would you give me the desire and the power to walk in obedience with you? In Jesus' name, amen.